thank you for coming tonight. And we're, we're beginning a new section in Genesis 9. And it's entitled The Rainbow Covenant. You know, one of the most extraordinary and beautiful natural wonders that we ever see uh, and intrigues a lot of people are rainbows. My wife loves to see rainbows. She will yell and point and try to get me to pull over and I'll say, eh. But uh, rainbows, in your outline, the word is rainbows, have fascinated people. Go ahead, Arlene, tell our rainbow story. I love rainbows, too. Well, I, I know your story. Yeah, tell it. Well, the, when I was in the hospital, he had to go to Fort Huachuca one day to pick up medicine. So he was coming from there to the university hospital. And he looked out and saw, he was praying for me, and looked out and saw a rainbow. Amen. Right? Amen. He, he just felt that was. Amen. That I would be all right. Amen. And here you are. Amen. God, God uses all sorts of things to confirm His communications to us. Yes. Uh, uh, when my, my boy got married, that was one of his past thing. I wanted to be at the wedding. Right. And so she did die before the wedding. And at the wedding, there was a rainbow with no clouds or nothing. Amen. She was still at the wedding. Amen. So she was there. Amen. We're going to learn a lot about rainbows tonight and specifically... Uh, the, the idea of uh, God's covenant with, with, uh, with us in regards to the rainbow. So, so there's a lot, of, a lot of richness, a lot of uh, affirmation in what you guys are saying. So there's many things you can consider about rainbows. You can look them up. Some people, I still have an encyclopedia. Did you, do you still have an encyclopedia? Uh, and if you did, you could you find a lot of articles on rainbows. Uh, you can go on the internet and look up rainbows, and you'll get more information than you would ever care to have about rainbows. And I think that's actually true about everything on the internet. You have more information than you ever wanted to know. But I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what rainbows are scientifically. And rain, a rainbow is a bent line or curve in the sky, and it consists of how many colors? This is a test now. Ready? How many? Four. Four. Six. Seven. Seven. And here's a way that you can remember the colors of the rainbow. I'll give you two ways. They used to teach in elementary school Roy G. Biv. Roy G. Biv. Or, if you grew up in England, they would teach you Richard of York gave battle in vain. And that, that, that provides an acrostic for those colors. And the colors are red, red orange. Yeah. Is this in your outline? Yes. Oh, no wonder you know. Okay. Red, no, orange, no. yellow, green, green. blue, indigo, and violet. Roy G. Biv or Richard of York gave battle in vain. Scientifically, a rainbow is a arc, uh, an arc across the sky of concentric colored bands that develop when sunlight interacts with raindrops. Sunlight is refracted as it enters a raindrop and then it causes 
a different wavelength of visible light. And the different wavelengths of visible light uh, separate and become the different colors of the rainbow. Longer wavelengths of light are colors like red. Uh, uh, since, the, since they are longer, they produce a, a uh, colors like red. The shorter ones produce colors like violet and blue. And then you have the spectrum in between the two. Uh, and it has to do with the angle that the sun shines through, the different uh, raindrops. If the ang angle, uh, there's a lot of scientific stuff, you know, if it's, if it's greater than uh, 48 degrees and the light will reflect back off of the raindrop. Do you know when you look at a rainbow, do you know where the sun is? It's behind you and it's hitting the raindrops and it refracts the light back towards you, okay? If the angle is smaller than 48 degrees, then the, then the sunlight just simply goes through the raindrops and that's what usually happens. So, uh, all depends on the configuration of the sun. And, but a, a, a rainbow is usually seen when part of the sky is dark and uh, so there's rain in one part of the sky and the sun which is usually behind you, is in the other side, uh, other part of the sky. Uh, so you're always, when you see a rainbow, next time you see a rainbow, see where the sun is, it'll be behind you. And uh, you have all these diverse colors that uh, are all produced by different wavelengths as the sun ref reflects off of those raindrops. Okay? That's a little bit of a, a very little bit of a scientific explanation because it's pretty deep if you actually get into it. But uh, all over the world, there are many myths and stories about rainbows. Now, most cultures understand that rainbows are simply the sun shining through or against rain, and that's correct. But in all sorts of different parts of the world, there's a lot of different beliefs in different cultures. One is the Albanian culture, where the rainbow is believed to be the belt worn by a goddess of beauty. Uh, and that goddess of beauty is a Catholic saint by the name of Pridi, P-R-I-N-D-Y. And that comes from a word that actually means uh, in Albanian, it means heaven. And supposedly, swallows are harnessed to her carriage and they pull her through the sky, down from the gates of heaven, and around her waist is a belt, which is, her, which is the rainbow. Okay? Pretty picture. In Greek mythology, which I have some, some uh, knowledge of, the goddess Iris, who is a daughter of Phimus and Electra. She's the si sister of Harpies, uh, who's a messenger from the gods of Olympus. She, again, is uh, considered the goddess of rainbows, and it's a, she, too, has a belt. When you think about a belt, you can see, you might see a belt in the rainbow. And uh, also in Greek mythology, rainbows are seen as a bridge between Earth in heaven, that's pretty, that's not uncommon in different cultures. In Australia, the, the uh, rainbow is seen as a serpent, all right? Also some African cultures are the same way. There's some uh, belief of that in Brazil, in, their, uh, in some of the older uh, cultures. Some parts of the world, they believe the rainbow is the cause of droughts because it appears when it's raining. And the superstition is that the rainbow is like a sponge and it pulls the water up from the earth and draws it into the sky. That's what creates droughts, that's what they believe. In ancient Europe, there was a myth that if you pointed your finger at a rainbow, your finger would fall off. <laughs> so don't point your finger at a rainbow. <laughs> 
But I think, of course, what's the most, okay, so what's the most familiar superstition about a rainbow? A lot of gold. And whose gold is it? <laughs> Who owns it? It's the leprechaun. That's an Irish myth. That's right. Pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, a bunch of treasure, uh, and, and you know, really, that treasure is supposed to have gold and everything you could ever hope or want for if you get to the end of that rainbow, which, incidentally, is impossible. Yeah. Is impossible. <laughs> in, the, in Eastern Europe, uh, there's the same type of uh, myth but in the Eastern Europe, it's angels who put the gold at the end of a rainbow. And it can only be found by a man who has no clothes. That's an unusual. But as Warren said, it's impossible. The law of physics makes it impossible for you to walk under a rainbow. And it makes it impossible to find the end of the rainbow. But if there are, but there are people again in ancient Europe that believe that if you passed underneath a rainbow, and you were a man, you would then become a woman, and if you were a woman, you would become a man. I'm glad that can't happen. Kind of a rainbow transgender transformation oh, deal. That's where it came from, huh? Yeah, real well. To Muslims in Iran, the brilliance of the colors of the rainbow, all, each color has a significance. Green means abundance, red means war, yellow means death. In South America, there's a tribe where the rainbow is recognized as a sign of good fortune if you see it over the sea, and it's a sign of bad fortune if you see it over the land. In northeastern Siberia, I guess they have rainbows in Siberia, the rainbow is seen as the tongue of the sun. And in America, there are North American tribes that regarded a rainbow as a bridge between the living and the dead, and so on. You could look up these beliefs you, uh, literally page after page. So the rainbow, as you can tell, has preoccupied people throughout history, even Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. Somewhere over the rainbow. Remember that song? Mm -hmm. Yep, old Dorothy. She was preoccupied with the rainbow. And even Kermit the Frog is waiting for the rainbow. Did you know that? And then, on a far less trivial note, as Karen mentioned, you know, Everything that's God, the world tries to steal. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the, the symbol is for homosexuality? Rainbow. The rainbow. You know how much the city of Tucson spent on a rainbow sidewalk? They painted a rainbow sidewalk on North 4th Avenue. I believe the final bill was over $70,000. And you know what now? They need to paint it again. Now I offered to go down and paint crosses on the sidewalk. Mm. Or the crosswalk. Mm. But they won't let you do that. But they will let you paint a rainbow that reflects the diversity of our culture. So is there any real meaning in a rainbow? And if there is, what is the meaning in a rainbow? What is its significance? Does it have an immense meaning? Uh, is it an immense significance? It's a covenant. Huh? It's a covenant. Because Amen. Amen. It's a symbol. It's a sign from God. And according to the Bible, there are no messages in the sun. There is no message in the moon. There is no message in the stars. They are signs, according to the book of Genesis, but they are signs, it says, of the seasons and of the days. In your outline, the words are sun, moon, and stars, which are signs 
of the seasons and the days. In other words, they're calendar signs. The, uh, the sun, the moon, the sky indicate to us day, night, and then the seasons, the, the way the, the stars rotate. The moon moves, its distance from the sun changes. The tilt of the earth produces seasons. And that's the signs that are found in the bodies of heaven, the stars, the sun, and the moon. They provide a constant reference uh, for us. Uh, almost all ancient calendars are based on what? The moon. The moon. 28 days. The constellations, uh, which have become the basis of horoscopes. Uh, do you know your, your birth sign? Gemini, Taurus, Aries. The constellations, I will tell you, have nothing to do with the Bible. In fact, they are pagan inventions, pagan astrological inventions, where they saw the stars and they drew lines between them and made up pictures. Pictures, things that aren't really up there, they're just stars. And uh, uh, most of them are, the, most of the constellations that we hear of today are actually identified with false Greek deities. God would never put paganism into the sky. Connecting the dots the way they're connected to create a constellation is an invention of man and has no, abs no absolutely no biblical meaning whatsoever. Still, if you want to find a book, how many of you know Dr. James Kennedy? He's in a large church in Florida. He wrote a book called The Real Meaning of the Zodiac, where he tried to attribute the constellations to God. He even says that the Bible is God's little book and the heavens are God's big book. I don't, pref I don't care for that theology. But there's only one thing that you will ever see in the sky that is a true sign and all that one thing that God placed there he placed as a spiritual message and again the word in your outline is the rainbow so I want us to look in Genesis 9 if you have your Bibles if not that's okay Genesis 9 and I'm going to read verses 8 through 17 and you don't have to get up it's a long day Genesis 9, 8 through 17. Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth, with you of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. Thus I establish my covenant with you, Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud." And it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a, a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The water shall never again destroy or never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Now that's a pretty important message. And in fact, it is divided in theology into three speeches. The first speech begins... In verse 8, if you wanted to mark them in your Bibles, you could. It ends with verse 11. The second speech begins in verse 12. 
It ends with verse 16. And the third uh, speech, which is a summary, is verse 17. Three speeches made by God to the family of Noah, eight people that at that particular moment constitute the entire population, the human population of the earth. And so God says in these three speeches to Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives, essentially what is a message to all of humanity, because all of humanity at that moment is those eight people, and it is a message which still stands to this very day. And it's an important message. And in verses 1 through 7, we have seen Noah and his family, God has, has been telling them, what he is going to do, or what they are going to do. He tells them, reproduce. He tells them, rule the earth. He tells them, eat all the stuff. And then he tells them to execute those who take lives. That's what he tells them in verses 1 to 7, very specifically. And so you have this instruction to Noah and his family about what they are supposed to do in those first seven verses. But now, in verse 8, God says what he's going to do. The word in your outline is the word God. God says what he's going to do. He told Noah what he was going to do. He told him, you're going to do these things. Now, Noah, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. He exhorts Noah to become all that he wants him to become. And now he's going to give Noah a promise from God. And the main point of what I read you is that God is going to make a promise. This is what I'm going to do, God says. I'm going to make with you a barith. In Hebrew, it's B-E-R-I-T-H. A barith. And we, from that word in Hebrew we end up with the word covenant, a promise made by God to man. And it's very impo important because this, this covenant establishes that God is a covenant maker as part of his personal commitment to man. Do you know how many covenants there are? Don't look at my fingers. Do you know how many there is? Seven. Really? Is that what your Bible says? Oh, well, and they just major covenants. And, oh, just the major covenants. Major covenants? Okay. I think there's six, but there might be oh. seven. I'll, I'll research that for the next lesson. Okay. But God is, a, God is a covenant maker. And this is his first covenant with man. And if you go through the entire Bible, you see God continually making promises to man. And, and, and God, I often pray that we would be as faithful as God is faithful. God can only be faithful. He cannot be unfaithful. And so here you have the first covenant that God makes. And he makes it with Noah's family, which constitutes at that moment all of humanity. So it's really a covenant or a promise, if you want to think of, of it that way, that God gives to all of mankind. Beyond that, he makes the... Not only does he make a promise to man, who else does he make a promise to? Who else is in there? Animals. The animals. It's a promise to the animals, to the creatures of the earth. And it's a simple one. I'm not going to do what I just did ever again. I'm never going to drown the world again in a universal flood. I will never again destroy, as the word says, the entire planet was destroyed by the great flood. Now, when you read this passage, you'll say, well, the, the same thing is repeated over and over. And yes, it is. Have you ever been in a court of law? Have you ever read a court document? It repeats the same thing over and over. And a covenant, in many ways, is a legally binding document, if you will. Not, not that God can be bound by anything except what he wants to be bound by. But... Here we have the same language over and over because it needs to be recapitulated. It needs to be summarized as if it is a legal document. 
and it demands thorough, thoroughness because it is so important to man. It's very well arranged, and don't, so don't underestimate the importance of the repetition here. And the word covenant, barith, is used seven times here, which is the number of perfection or completion. And this is truly a covenant. And, and the repetition, I believe, makes it powerful and strengthens it. And in verse 9, he says, I establish, the way that is written in the Hebrew, it means it is immediate. I establish now. Verse 11, it says, thus I establish. That means it is in the present mode. And then verse 17, it says, I have established, written in the perfect uh, in the present perfect tense, which means I will do it. So it means, that means I have done it. I will do it. I do it immediately, and I have done it. Very, the language is very specific, okay? God initiates the covenant, he enacts the covenant, and he completes the covenant. And the sign of the covenant is also stated repeatedly and the sign is stated in verse 12 the sign is established in verse 13 it is guaranteed for the future in verses 14 and 15 and God himself will notice the sign he says in verse 16 so all this repetition is part of a comprehensive character of this covenant and the sign of the covenant so why this covenant well simply because it's a blessing for man. It's a blessing for man as it is symbolically representative of the mercy of God, the goodness of God, the goodness of life from God. It is an example of God's grace. And first thing I want you to consider, Noah. We do not believe it had ever rained before the flood, right? Right? That's what we believe. That's what I believe. I think at the flood, it rained for the first time for 40 days and 40 nights. Remember, the earth went into upheaval. Uh, in many ways, it exploded. Gas and material went up into the sky, and it broke up the water canopy, which once surrounded the earth. That's why people used to live eight, nine hundred years long, they were in a perfect environment. And the water in that canopy came down as a deluge, and it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. And at the same time, remember the fountains of the earth underneath, which had great reservoirs and water in them, let go of that water, and the entire planet was covered by water. And now, in this new world, rain is going to be what? It's going to be common, right? In the new world, it's going to rain regularly. God, has, God, in his wisdom, has a hydrological cycle where the clouds, the, the wind blows across the ocean waters and the friction causes uh, evaporation. And the evaporation goes up into and makes clouds and the clouds travel across the water and then they hit land and then the wind pushes the clouds up over these mountain ranges and it condenses those clouds and those clouds get condensed and then they have rain and they drop that rain down onto the ground and then those streams run into rivers and the rivers run into the oceans and then the wind blows across the ocean. God's perfect hydrological cycle, okay? So the rain now that is gonna fall is a blessing. And it says it's a blessing on who? The just and the unjust. Does it rain only on good people? Hi, Maya. Hi, Kukla. Hi, Maya Moo. 